<laughs> Good morning, everybody. So uh, it was very quiet. It was beautiful to say something in this situation. Okay, so I will simply continue basically at the point where I left yesterday. But for the ones who were not, who is f new here, who was not here yesterday? Hey. Okay. So then I will, before I start, very briefly summarize um, what, we, what I said yesterday. <clears throat> so in this course I want to give a, um, an overview of different formalisms and methods to describe temporal change in, in systems that scientists want to model of all kinds of complexity, from very simple to very complex. And also to give an idea of different ways of thinking about temporal development. So not just one technique after the other, that after a while you just get dizzy but satisfied. No, you will not get dizzy but not satisfied. Uh, because in the end, there will be very many very open questions. And there are some deep questions connected to how to think about temporal change and about systems. And I want to at least touch some of these deeper questions. In, on top of giving you an overview of very many different modeling techniques. And yesterday I started, in a sense, simple, with uh, so-called discrete time models of systems. That is, time is just hacked into pieces and the mathematical formalism describes temporal progression as jumping from one situation to the next, to the next, to the next. So that's discrete time. And discrete state systems. That is, um, whatever one observes, whatever one models, comes in finite sets, so a system can only go through a hop between different states, which you can number, so one, two, three, four. Um, you can only observe finitely many different outcomes of something, so yes, no, a sequence of yes, no, or red, green, blue, red, green, blue, blue, red, green. That's discrete valued systems. And uh, that's what I, I was sort of summarizing yesterday. A number of formalisms that use discrete time and discrete values, discrete state, everything discrete. Um, as opposed to some stuff that I will explain more today, where you have continuous time and continuous values. But I'm not done yet with the discrete uh, uh, formalisms. Um, I st st started yesterday to go into discrete systems, discrete time, discrete state systems, where, however, the system description has also a spatial organization. And I started with cellular automata, which I, which I love personally a lot because I did my diploma thesis on cellular automata a long time ago, so I like them, and, um, the, which is not necessarily the case for a topic uh, where you did your diploma thesis in. <laughs> and so, let me just check, I have to, does this work? Yeah, so th this is uh, a number of graphical displays of so-called two-dimensional cellular automata. What you see is basically videos and with relatively coarse granularity. Um, you can have such systems basically modeling anything that you want to develop in space and time. So here we have two space dimensions and one time dimension. And um, explaining them how they are set up can be better done in one dimension where the system's snapshot, these pictures would be just lines. Um, such one, deter one dimensional deterministic cellular automata are defined by a finite set of states here just red and green, and a local transition function, which basically takes a neighborhood, three patches of color, one by one, and tells us if I see this, what will be the color at the next time step. And a full specification of such three neighborhood to one next uh, is given in this graphical table here. So all red, next one will be red two red, one green, next one will be green, and so forth. And if one plugs this together into a model of spatial computing, then at time zero, 
you would have a configuration, a system description snapshot, which is just a possibly infinite st strip of cells colored in red and green. This comes from somewhere, so someone just tells you how to start your simulation. And then, in order to find out how this should look at the next time step, you just pass this function locally over all triplets here and always check what will be the next time step color at this particular location. For instance, if you see red, green, green, where, 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 red, green, green, red. So the next one will be red and so forth. So in this way, you can define a, a computationally efficient, fast way to simulate colorful, um, uh, how do you say, evolutions of, of, uh, of the, in this case, one dimensional color band over time as it happens. And the same can be done in two dimensions. That's what you saw on this entry screen and so forth. So now I want to say a few words on how are these cellular automata used? What, you can, what can you do with them? They have quite an impact in some branches of abstract physics and computer science. Yesterday I said that John von Neumann invented them in order to find out uh, the fundamental rules for self-replicating systems. So what's, he wanted to know what is the information theoretic angle of uh, life. Just that question he answered is with cellular automata. Today they are used in two different fields, in also in very different ways. They are used in theoretical computer science as an abstract model of parallel computing. So where the idea is these are all little processes which can communicate only locally with neighboring processes. But if you plug together large arrays of such local processes, you can get a, a very powerful global processor. So that, and, and that's a simple, a super simple model of parallel computing and in theoretical computer science this is explored. This was very fashionable, important um, in the 1980s or so, which is where I did my thesis. <laughs> it has become a little bit out of fashion because today parallel computing is done, um, well, you know it, on the grid, in the cloud, uh, where you have not very simple local cells, but basically uh, computers themselves here. And so this model is, is not really matching the current technology. However, it may change again in the future. Um, it is actually about to change. Novel physics, novel devices for novel microchips are again, in a sense, shifting into this direction to have parallel computers of this kind where the individual cells really are very microscopic, very simple, tiny circuits. That's also an area I'm, I'm involved in. So if you're interested in the next generation parallel computing super microchips um, that might or might not work, um, you, can, you can ask me questions over dinner. Um, okay, so, so, some comments. So that is, well, one thing I should say, these are universal machines. So in a sense, everything that can happen in 2D or 3D space and that normal physicists would describe by partial differential equations. If you discretize them, you can replace that by a cellular automaton. And you can emulate Turing machines with cellular automatons. So they are universal simulation engines. You, in a sense, up to discretization errors, you can do everything with them. That's why these pictures in the, on the entry screen look so colorful. In a sense, it's up to you to to try to invent whatever kind of video sequence you want to see, you will find a cellular automaton that does this. So they are very general, but also they are very simple. And this simplicity, um, that comes, I was too fast. I'm not going to talk about simplicity for another two minutes. I will first talk about complexity, the opposite of simplicity. Um, I don't know who has seen these things. They, they were quite, let's say, spectacular at that time, so 15 years ago when these were first published. This is a real world seashell, and that's one that has been, whose pattern has been simulated by a one dimensional cellular automaton. So, what you see here the, in, in the real 
seashell, these patterns emerge or develop. As the seashell grows, it has a growing edge here, which sort of grows, 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 grows. And at the growing line, growth line, something like um, a reaction diffusion system, which you can discretize and get a cellular automaton for this one dimensional uh, development. And if it unfolds, you see if you hit the right rule for this, you get patterns that look really strikingly similar to what you see in nature. Um, I should say there is, uh, there will be an online version of these slides and um, those slides have extra slides that I have uh, hidden here that contain hinters to the literature, so uh, pointers to the literature. So if you're interested in any of these things in more depth, you can just check out the online slides and, and then there is uh, every third or so slide is just literature. So you can, and, and, and web links where you can check out these, these nice things. Okay, so pattern formation, self-organization of all sorts have been um, addressed with cellular automata by physicists a lot. And here is one, uh, in a sense, highlight of this <coughs> line of reasoning of very abstract thinking about what can happen in space and time. These are the celebrated Wolfram classes of complexity. So Stephen Wolfram, some of you may have heard the name, inventor of Mathematica and inventor in the sense of a way of thinking about uh, cellular automata. He was investigating, um, and still is, um, cellular automata as, in a sense, abstract models of how could God design a world. So if God wants to have an interesting world, what rule for the in, in elementary level physics should God use? And um, so it should not be too simple. So this would be a, a, a stupid God, if I may say so. Um, in finding a cellular automaton rule, if you started after a very short time, everything is just dead, blacked out. So these are Wolfram class one worlds or universes. Then class two, everything after a short time gets stationary. So time, this is one dimensional. So every, you should see this as time going from top to down, uh, top to bottom. There's an initial random seed configuration and after a short time it organizes itself into something that's just, well, stable you see is something, there's a rhythm, so it's repetitive. It, it gets into an, uh, a, a spatially stationary attractor state. Third class is, um, looks like noise, and that's um, what Wolfram also thinks. Uh, um, you know, mat some of you have heard about Mathematica, or use it, uh, uh, a mathematical modeling tool. It started with Wolfram using class three cellular automata as random number generators. So the rand function, getting a random number, is not trivial to implement. So because there is no randomness on computers, you have to use pseudo-random algorithms. And Wolfram found that these class three cellular automata give relatively cheap but quite good pseudo-random number generating algorithms. And his first set of public domain implementations of stuff, the sort of precursors to Mathematica, were basically just this here. Um, and then uh, there is another type of rules which give structure like this. If you start in the you will see something that people may call self-organization. So after a while, things sort themselves out, but they don't die out. So as time goes on, larger and spatially wide, more far-reaching structures emerge, interact, cancel each other, things that always, in a sense, never stop being interesting. If, if you would um, continue the, the, this both in space and in time, um, you would also see possibly patterns of self-similarity, but uh, if you look at these things, closer resolution looks basically similar to what you see at, at very large resolutions. So you get what is known as multi-scale behavior, self-organization, pattern formation, whatever. And the contribution of Wolfram was to say, okay, this basically, had, uh, what can happen? There are these three classes, four classes. And he, he gave uh, algebraic descriptions of what must such a rule satisfy to be this class, this class, this class, or that class. 
So it's a, in a sense a, a deep algebraic insight into how, at least in discrete systems, um, one could design universes. Um, one can also criticize this in many, many ways, but Wolfram believed he had found a key to understand realities plural. Okay, <coughs> again, I, what do you think, do I think about Wolfram? <laughs> <laughs> from my facial expression. So, is my facial expression rather neutral? <laughs> no. <laughs> Only after beer and um, so let's next topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other, so one is in basically in, in the sciences and in theoretical physics as modeling real physical systems or as Wolfram very abstract stuff. And the other is in the theory of computing. So theoretical computer scientists use this, not for pattern formation as it was shown here, but to understand how can I build basically really computers that are made of very many interacting little local processors. And this leads to very different ways of asking questions. So there's very little overlap between the two. They only use the same basic formalism. So this is one thing, petri nets, um, that uh, I think is underappreciated. Um, who knows, who has worked with, who knows petri nets? Ah, so more than I believe. Who knows them from my course two years ago? So, <laughs> so yeah. So petri nets is a formalism um, to describe this. It's a, again a discrete model, spatially distributed, but um, in a sense not very regularly spatially distributed systems, like production systems. So like. Uh, assembly lines, like economic systems where you have many players that exchange money, for instance, or uh, systems where agents talk to each other and exchange messages. So in a sense, it's, it's a model of locations that are connected by pathways on which they can exchange either materials or messages or pieces of information. Petri nets have been used by engineers. It's a very engineering-oriented uh, approach. Uh, to model um, Petri himself uh, design of microchips, so where bits are transmitted between little uh, logical uh, gates. It has also been used in production manufacturing modeling. And in, I think in very many other areas, it's a, it's a still alive and, and uh, community. So you, there are workshops, conferences and stuff still on Petri nets, but it's not very commonly known, it's, it's, it's a niche, but I find an interesting one. So I want to make this uh, not popular, but at least alert you to this. Um, so what is a Petri net? It is modeled as consisting of what they call, it's their terminology, places, transitions, arcs, they, that's just the words they use, and tokens. So the idea is places are either really physical places, locations, or agents that do something. Um, and it is, the idea is that these agents interact by exchanging something, either material artifacts or messages. They, uh, each agent or each uh, place um, can, at some point in time, have something to, to pass on, some information or some goods or some prefabrication items, called tokens. They are, um, just the number of tokens is important. So there, there are no green or blue tokens, they're just tokens. And this communication or fabrication uh, or material transformation pathways function like this, I think, even on the next slide, yeah. So it works, so the idea is um, there's a temporal process going on. Uh, 
from one such configuration to the next, to the next, to the next. And I will now explain one update step, how such a PetriNet model updates itself from one time step to the next. It's a local update operation, so these um, PetriNets are changed or updated locally only. One finds a transition that is called enabled, which means that uh, so the arcs have numbers with them. The numbers don't change. These are, in a sense, bandwidths or requirements. The idea is that this is, you could think of this as a, as a production step, where something is assembled, created. In order to assemble something here, it needs, uh, let's say, components. These are the tokens. So this assembly step needs two kinds of this and one kind of this. And then it produces three kinds of this and one kind of this. But in order to, you could say, fire, this production thing or item or production assembly, uh, well, this transition, um, it needs at least two of these and one of these. Okay, so now we find one transition. I, I could actually make this longer, so. <laughs> we find one um, where there is enough supply so it needs two of this, but there are three, so that's fine. It needs one of those, there are two, that's fine. And then it, it does its production step. It takes two of them, takes one of them, so they're gone here, and produces three of these, so there are three more here, and one of these, so there's one more here. And now you can update such a um, so, so total configuration. Uh, either asynchronously that, or randomly, that is, you, in order to update it, you just pick at random one of the enabled transitions and, and execute it. Or you can introduce some update order um, in, in which two cases you get different types of dynamics. They can be analyzed. And that's one of the, that I would say, strong points of these uh, Petri nets. Do I? Yeah. The, um, in a sense, there is, when you do modeling of, of systems, um, there's always a trade-off between the degree of abstraction that you, in, that you put into your models. Simple abstract models that have few parameters and few dimensions are easier to analyze mathematically. So there's, in a sense, more general insight that you can get from simpler models. But reality is more complex, so you want to also have very complex models. Um, so every modeling adventure that you go through is, starts with a compromise of where you sort of balance between abstraction and analytical transparency that you get from the abstraction versus uh, veracity, so that you actually really model what you want to model. Then you need to model more detail, but you lose the power of abstraction and you understand actually less about your system in the end. And these Petri nets, um, according to, their, to this community self-perception, is a very useful balance between abstraction on the one hand side, but still complexity enough that you can actually handle Things like assembly lines or um, computer chips, th these would be logical gates that, produce, that sort of process bits. Um, all kinds of social interaction systems. And still ask abstract questions like, for instance, what are stable final configurations? Does such a system run into dead end? And questions what may happen, what, what good, what, what bad thing may ultimately happen, can be sometimes analytically answered in these models. So you get, in a sense, uh, some specific flavor of compromise between abstraction and concreteness. I personally have never worked with Petri nets, um, but still I think it's good to know them, especially for social scientists, um, the ones who, or, yeah, I think social scientists, uh, um, would benefit from knowing Petri nets. Um, and, and that's my little mission here. So um, the ones of you who are social scientists, never heard of them, try to model interaction pathways between either people or 
or little communities or whatever things that you could call places. Now you know there is this <coughs> modeling apparatus out there and there's a large literature on, on formal analysis of such systems. Okay. So now, it's, this is a new, now a different way of modeling. It's still discrete time, discrete uh, states. And I start with uh, something that has no time in it yet. So there is a modeling, a, a family of formalisms uh, called Bayesian uh, models or Bayesian uh, networks or more general graphical models. The idea is that uh, one describes a piece of reality by what is known as random variables, observables. So each of these circles is something you can quantify or observe. For instance, my favorite example is um, uh, the uh, system that really has been built, um, namely a monitoring system for the launch phase, the countdown phase for space shuttle. So when, you know, 10, 9, blah, blah, blah. So in, this, in these few seconds and in the minutes before, many things can go wrong. So a space shuttle is sort of started up by switching on many circuits, many sub-mechanisms, um, many pumps and many valves, one after the other in a very well-defined way. And many things can go wrong. And such a space shuttle is full of sensors. So hundreds and thousands of sensors, I don't really know how many, that, that try to, to see is everything working okay. Because in a sense, not, you, don't have a, you have a very small error margin in starting a space shuttle. And now it happens that many sensors typically work well, but some will not work well. So it's a typical thing in, in such very complex systems that sensors do misread. Okay, so what you get is an extremely terrible monitoring and supervision and action decision-making uh, situation. During the countdown, you get a stream of sensor inputs. Some of them you know are wrong because the sensor is, is just not working well, but you don't know exactly which ones. And on this, and you, you as the, let's say, final decision maker, you have to say, okay, carry on, continue with the countdown or abort. Something is so out of control that, that you should stop. This is something that a human cannot do anymore. So the complexity of this supervision task is too large for humans to do. So this has been modeled. This whole network of sensors and valves and, and pipe, I don't know what happens on board of such a space shuttle, has been network, has been modeled by such a system where each of these circles would monitor one quantity. So one sensor reading, one flow of oxygen, whatever. So I really don't know what are those circles. Um, you would have hundreds of these circles, not only three. There are some circles that have no errors going into them. These would be external inputs, control inputs that you can put into the system. It's your decision making right to, to set the values of these. And there are some outputs things that are observable, actually these would be the sensor readings. So the final outputs, the green ones, are observable. The blue ones are what is known as hidden states, states or observables that are not observable. Not observable. For instance, a temperature in some reactor where this, uh, or a pressure where you can't measure the pressure. And then the engineer knows it's there, this quantity, but you don't know the value. So one can only indirectly infer the value from some measurements with sensors. So think of this as a very large network. In, uh, in the, let's say, more basic formalisms of Bayesian networks, these places or these uh, variables, random variables, can only take finitely many values. So you have discretization at some point. And then these arrows mean um, basically conditional probabilities, or if you're bold, you could say these are causal pathways. So if an arrow is going from here to here, then the idea is there is a causal influence. If this changes, this changes. All of this is expressed in terms of probabilities. So 
and this is not a, a one-to-one -one deterministic mechanism. If you tune this, that will change like that. It is a matter of conditional probabilities. So if I change this, then with a certain probability, this will change like that. So such Bayesian networks have been uh, analyzed by both physicists um, and uh, machine learners a lot, so much is known about them, but they are not temporal. So we have not yet talked about time and today's business for us is to, to talk about time. So how do you get time into the picture? Well, in a sense, automatically you get it if you have circular pathways of causal, causal interactions between these variables. So here you see a little circle. So if you have these, an engineer might just write down local causal pathways because the engineer knows this interacts with this. So if, I, if this changes, this must also change. And, that, and suddenly you have a, a circle. And then you have a problem because um, once you have circles and you try to compute global probability distributions based on, on local observations, these circles will start to try to update their values in a circular way and this leads automatically to a temporal evolution. And well, at some point you just accept this and you directly design temporal systems that look like this and they basically they unfold the circles not by circling back into itself but by circling back into itself but at the next time step. So whenever you have a circle here or an arrow it does not lead to the same copy of those variables but the arrow now leads to a sister or brother of the same um, variable, but at the next time step. So here we have time from left to right. All of these are copies of this one, but now indexed with time. And when there's a causal influence, let's say from x1 to y1, then it goes from x1 at time zero now to y1 at time one. So in this way, you can unfold such a causal network or uh, probability distribution network in time and you get what is known as a dynamic Bayesian network or dynamic graphical models. These models, uh, I told you, uh, I promised yesterday that um, all the discrete time, discrete value models that I'm covering in this uh, lecture are learnable from data and this still holds for dynamic Bayesian networks. So there are methods developed by machine learners which if you have observation data, empirical data that you, you get from experiments or just by monitoring internet traffic or whatever, of input and output values. So you see that someone did something to a system some input that's known, that's part of the data that you have, these uh, reddish dots, and you see you, some measurement values, sensor flows, whatever, that comes out of the experiment or out of the system. And there are many blue dots. These are internal, uh, you could say, causal factors or uh, processing stages inside the system that you want to model, but you, you don't have direct access. They are unobservable. You, uh, in the simplest case, you have a theoretical model of, that looks like this. So you, you say as a modeler, internally we have these and these and these state variables. So I wire them up with these and these arrows. And then there are ways to learn the complete internal hidden probability distributions from input-output observation data. So this is, um, in a sense, at the extreme limit of what machine learning can do today uh, by way of uh, inferring complex models from input-output data that have been observed. So this is about it. M more complication gets very hard to... to, to to learn from data. And that's also the last, yeah? So, 
Actually, this remembers me a lot to, I don't remember the name of yesterday, Poem D? Uh, Poem like, yeah. It was like hidden Markov models. Yes. Yeah. It. Yes. Hidden Markov models are the simplest kind of, you're right, hidden Markov models are a special case of dynamic Bayesian networks. A hidden Markov model basically has only a single blue, uh, blue circle inside. Um, namely, that's the state of the hidden Markov chain. And it would have only a single cy uh, orange uh, arrow cycling back. So they are very much more simple than, than this. And so these uh, Bayesian networks are uh, very powerful extensions and, and they hit the limit of what can be handled today by mathematicians and by uh, machine learners. Okay, so comments, to them, to them. No, I, many things, so I, I, I skip over many slides um, because I already have said stuff that is on the slides, it always surprises me. And um, I, I feel in a sense bad about one part of this course. All of these techniques and models that I'm going to present, I can only present it in five minutes at, at most. But each of them would deserve a full, uh, uh, a full <coughs> tutorial session in, in, a, in an IK course. So... You can come to my course at the end of the... Uh, you will have such a dynamic patient. Yeah, you will. Yeah, okay. Uh, which example do you use? Also the space my, shuttle? My, um, the, the HDF, the mm -hmm. hierarchical gaussian filter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a network of exactly that kind that you just introduced. Yeah, so, you see? Go there. What is, <laughs> the, name? <laughs> um, what is the name of it? <laughs> 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 no, it's, it's, it is um, borderline misleading. Um, it's about um, modeling in Psychiatry or something. <laughs> <laughs> modeling in neuroscience and psychiatry. Yes, modeling in neuroscience and psychiatry. But it's about models like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wednesday, on Wednesday to Friday. Okay. okay, so, oh, good, wonderful. So, here's a summary slide by which I want to end this part, this first part of this uh, of this series. Um, the discrete time and discrete value are just discrete systems. Um, I think the important thing is that, um, which I also mentioned yesterday, but because some of you are, uh, were not here yesterday, um, as, an, as a modeler, one has the freedom and the responsibility at the beginning of modeling uh, to decide what level of abstraction can I use? Basically, every system can be modeled with every type of model. Uh, that's not quite true, but, uh, but almost true. So you have to sit down and think about, okay, I have now, let's say, an ant colony. I want to model this ant colony. You can model it at sort of the super microscopic level of the motions of the individual ants, da, 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 of all of the ants in 3D space with gravity and everything. And maybe even the cell physiology of each ant. It's clear that this is only possible in principle. Okay, so you have to make some compromise and, and simplify a little bit. You could also say, what would be the super extreme simplification of an ant colony? I would say dead or alive. So binary state, uh, I, I, I think much simpler, it's difficult to think. So you just, a two state discrete process, dead or alive, the entire colony. <laughs> but then you could maybe think of, um, okay, um, if I simplify away from the ant colony in this brutal way, uh, that seems almost not too interesting. So I, I I do a little bit more. How could you get a little bit more out of 
this super simplification. So you, you start with this super simplification, dead or alive, but that's too much. Add a little bit of spice and, and uh, what, for instance, you could start doing spatial modeling with cellular automata, have a cellular automaton system of, let's say, if you model desert ants of, of a desert landscape. So the 2D grid would be just a map of, of a piece of the desert. And each cell could be just either green or blue. Green if there's a live ant colony, blue if, if there's none. Then you add a little bit of stochasticity and maybe some shades of green and blue for showing migration pathways of the ants. And very soon you have an interesting analyzable model of one aspect of what can happen in ant colonies. So I want to open your eyes to the fact that you can, like a king, like an emperor, as a modeler, decide what do you want to model and then there are so many ways to, um, to, to pick interesting formalisms. And there, for all of them, there's a large literature. Be, be assured of that. There's always enough literature um, to, uh, to, to know what you can analyze with this model. Hmm. I don't know whether this... So <laughs> at, at the end of, uh, of error report, uh, pages in, in the internet you always find was this comment helpful <laughs> yes no so <laughs> was it helpful yes no take it off yeah oh, yeah okay thank you <laughs> okay so one more thing um, it's not easy to say when is a model actually complex or not because I'm, I pointed this out yesterday these even the simplest possible finite state finite uh, discrete time models, the, the deterministic finite automata that I mentioned yesterday, they look so simple. But if they get very large, if you have very many states, they can approach any degree of complexity that you wish. So in a sense, it's not even clear uh, what is the abstraction level of a formalism. So even the simplest formalism can get arbitrarily weird and wild if, if, if just you have very many states or very fine-grained time or whatever. Okay, so I promised yesterday that I want to confuse you. And that's part of my mission to, uh, to confuse you. And now I, I continue with continuous time models. And yeah. So this is a now, there, there will be a few formulas, um, but not too many. Um, continuity occurs either in time, so that you have continuous time lines, or in the things that you observe and monitor, the state values, where you can have now uh, in continuous domains real values, not just symbols, A, B, green, blue, but real valued numbers. So if you trace an oscillation with a nice sine wave, then it's continuous in time and in value. So there is a, a, a deep mathematical distinction between discrete time, but continuous value, and continuous time, continuous value. So now I will, this slide is, is devoted to discrete time, so you have time evolving in steps. N is one time step, plus one is the next time step. So there's jump time. And the, uh, the basic way to describe something in continuous value spaces, basically vector spaces, is to have an update operator, call it T, that takes a state at some time and returns the next one. So you, it's also called iterated maps. Um, I think that's more or less clear, but what can we say about such iterated maps? Um, first of all, there is a, a, a very fundamental, I always say very fundamental, so I, I, I monitor myself. Uh, every other slide I say this is very fundamental, very basic. Um, you can do two things. 
either believe me, so that there are all very many fundamental things here, or think, okay, <laughs> let him talk. So, um, <laughs> either way is good. So the, um, there is this very fundamental <laughs> distinction between autonomous systems and or what the mathematicians call autonomous systems, and non-autonomous systems. It has nothing to do with autonomous robots or something. So the word autonomous is used differently in, very, in different communities. In mathematical theory, an autonomous system is one basically that has no input and no noise also. So it just, you get a typically deterministic update from one moment to the next. The previous state is all you have to define the next state. In non-autonomous system, there's also an input term. So the next state depends on the previous state, but also on something that comes from the outside, plus possibly a noise term. Mathematically, external input and noise are, are quite uh, similar because they, they just change the update in a way that cannot be predicted from, from the previous state. This is leads to non-autonomous system, and I will spend 30 minutes at the, the very end of this whole course to, dis, uh, to describe a few recent developments in the theory of non-autonomous system. One should be aware of the fact that classical math and classical dynamical system theory comes from studying autonomous systems. So, the reason is that the theory of dynamical systems evolved, co-evolved between physicists and mathematicians. So many of the classical results come from this interaction. And physicists, as I explained yesterday, try to understand the system, how it functions, what is the law. And they try to isolate a system in the experimental conditions from external perturbations. So they do not want to have this, they do not want to have this. They only want to have the pure internal laws of the system. So physicists are typically happy and, and they try to make the system in physical, in, in experimental conditions as autonomous as possible. And the laws of physics are for autonomous systems. So I would say 90, even more, 95% of available systems theory is about autonomous systems. And only very recently, really very recently, since 1995 or so, the mathematicians have picked up on describing non-autonomous dynamical systems, which are far more difficult to understand. And I want to say a few words at the end of this, of tomorrow's last lecture on, on non-autonomous mathematics, so to speak. Okay, so that's a distinction, autonomous, non-autonomous. And another special case of, well, uh, non-autonomous systems is linear systems. This is when these maps basically are just linear maps. So, uh, matrix, matrices. So you get a linear system equation by saying the next state is taking the previous one, apply a linear map that is pass it through a matrix. Same, there's an input, pass it also through a matrix and possibly a noise term. And one can observe an output. As I mentioned yesterday, I will always use Y for outputs of systems, U for inputs into systems, and X for system states. So there's also an output, um, which is also a linear map that reads out of the internal state. Um, I'm just doing name dropping here. So we'll take home, there exists Auton iterated maps, it iterated function systems, autonomous case, non-autonomous case. I will say much more about that later, not today, but tomorrow. And a special case linear systems. This is uh, something that, in a sense, is, is an important fundamental fact of life. Um, dynamical system theory and statistics also, becomes manageable for mathematicians and end users when everything is linear. So signal processing for 400 years has basically worked with linear system models. Um, many of the most powerful models in applied statistics are linear, 
let's say PCA, principal component analysis and others, are linear methods. Linear is just good because you know what you're doing. You have cheap algorithms that, or relatively cheap algorithms that you understand. Everything is analyzable. Um, so there is a just natural beauty about linear systems. And therefore, much mathematical results, much tools, much simulation engines just rely on linearity, whether it's true or not, whether it's good or not. One should be aware of the fact that uh, modeling is easier and much more transparent if you find ways to make your system look linear. So uh, just a very general comment, many real world systems are approximately linear if either they are receiving only very low amplitude input or if um, you look at, at only very short time scales. Um, and the ones of you who have contacts with engineers, signal processing control engineers, who of you has contact with these people? <laughs> yeah, okay, so then you will find that the textbooks and the courses of signal processing and uh, control basically are about linear system models. So if they want to model an airplane or another very complex system that they have to control, they start with matrices. However, they know the system is super nonlinear. So especially a famous case of very nonlinear system is uh, to control a, a, a combat aircraft. So they are flown in very nonlinear regimes, but the control engineers only understand how to do linear control. So what do they do? They chop the model, they multiply the model. So they, they create one linear model for basically each flight configuration moment of, the, of this aircraft. So from, model, from moment to model, from moment to moment, they model the aircraft with different linear models. And then they find ways to interpolate between these different linear models. So the attraction force of linear modeling is very strong. And that's why I give it an extra box here. Um, but often it's, it's done only out of convenience and because the textbook knowledge available is confined to linear models. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So I will say more about uh, iterated maps uh, in a special section later this afternoon. So then the continuous time equivalent of these are ordinary differential equations. It looks basically the same. Uh, so we have, well, not, not quite the same, but uh, very related. Uh, autonomous systems now T instead of N means I'm, uh, indicates I'm talking about continuous time. Uh, the physicists have introduced this dot notation. So for the temporal derivative, the rate of change of the state X at time T, written as X dot of T, if that is just a function of the current state, you have what is known as an ordinary differential equation. If this thing is finite dimensional, so if this is a vector. Okay, so obviously I can't give an introduction to the theory of differential equations here. Again, there is the version where one has a non-autonomous in input here. You will see there's no noise term here. It's not so easy to handle noise in ODEs. I will do this in a separate slide. And there's also the linear case. So this linear case, that is the bread and butter type of system in classical uh, system analysis done by engineers. So they use this basically all the time for their classical results. Okay, so I just, you see, I'm not explaining very much here. Uh, I'm just saying these things exist. Uh, I will later this afternoon try to give an overview of things that can happen with such systems. At this moment, I'm just collecting names. So then there is, um, uh, of, uh, let's say uh, uh, an enriched version of uh, differential equations. 
um, so-called stochastic differential equations, they, mo they can be used in cases when apparently there is, you have continuous time and, and continuous values, so you, 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 you monitor and describe motions or processes. But there is jittering, something is jittering, and if you run the same process twice, it looks different each time. <laughs> so then you have to add randomness to the picture somehow, but you want to keep the continuity of everything. So, and then you end up with stochastic differential equations. Um, the idea of uh, a stochastic differential equation, the formalism is that they have two parts. So you describe, uh, think of this as the differential change, a rate of change of the observable. Here, xt would be uh, a two-dimensional point, so just one point in this field. How is the rate of change defined? It has two components in stochastic differential equations. One is uh, what, what is known from, or is inherited from a classical ordinary differential equation. It's called the drift component. So the, um, and if we had, if we would not have this part, you would just get an ODE, an ordinary differential equation, and you would have clean trajectories or paths, the blue line here. But then you add another term, um, which, uh, which basically is just jitter. So you just, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a scaled Brownian motion, so it, it's just a very random little, but well-behaved little random process, which is overlaid to this drift component. It's called the diffusion part of a st stochastic differential equation. And then if you um, basically integrate this thing, then you get trajectories or paths that look the way how you want them to look. Namely, basically there's this drift, there's this general trend, which can be cleanly described, plus there's a also cleanly describable random component of, of jittering around this. So the um, stochastic differential equations are not easy to handle, so it needs, um, uh, let's say, a decent mathematical education or a physics education. Theoretical physicists love them. And then you end up, in, if you do this, in a particular hardcore school of modeling that in the neurosciences is common in Europe, in the, what I call the French school. So I know a number of French uh, neural modelers who come from physics, theoretical physics, and they, they always use these models here and <coughs> build on, again, fundamental theorems that the mathematicians and physicists have found about the uh, asymptotic behavior of such systems especially and about average behavior of such systems. And then they, they describe brains uh, using these uh, formalisms. But as I said, yesterday and repeated today, it's a design decision for every modeler to decide what, what you want to see, what formalism you use, and then in the end you see what you get from that formalism. So these, I call them the French school because most of them are French, um, at least the ones that I know. Um, they see the world like this, they see brains like this, they see the processes in each neuron like this, and then they can only discover or rediscover what the, those theoretical models can give them. Those theoretical models have been invented by physicists, and that's not quite true. And they have been refined and used by physicists um, <coughs> in context of a, a branch of physics called ergodic theory, um, occupied with the average behavior of large populations of, of, of little items, firing neurons, for instance, and then that's what you can analyze and what you can observe. And then there's one thing you should not do. And the thing that you should not do is to say that's the truth. So that you then write a paper and say the brain does it like this. So, and, and this some, that's, that's a trap uh, that's easy to fall in, if, especially if you master a very complicated formalism and can come up with results of simulations and, and analysis which are non-trivial, and then you think, okay, I have a deep insight here, but this only reflects your choice of the modeling formalism. 
other people use different formalisms and come to very just orthogonal insights. I don't know whether this was helpful. <laughs> so. Okay, stochastic differential equations. Why? Yeah? So, so in the case of the stochastic differential equations, now the state variables become random variables? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, uh, I switched to capital X, because uh, mathematicians love capital X for random variables. Mm -hmm. So then there's another thing. Yes? One, one more thing. Uh, so physicists like brown emotions. Yeah. When I look at these trajectories, I think I like, know I would actually prefer smoother uh, noise terms here. So is there also research going in the direction of Noise no, this is um, this is general. So it is just like the Turing machine. Basically, every stochastic motion can be interpreted. Uh, well, basically every uh, in this way. So um, this is a Brownian motion process, but it is scaled or, or by a time-dependent uh, factor here. So and this makes it super flexible. <coughs> Okay, so and, and this is this. These are results from mathematics. How to describe temporal change in continuous time, continuous values where you have randomness. So mathematicians have thought about this on their own, and they come up with these models. And they are, uh, in a sense, the most general possible model. So you do not, by saying I, I use Brownian motion for the noise term, you do not confine your model to to a very specific clean subtask uh, subtype. It's it's general. Okay, delay differential equations. Um, that is another way to enrich the formalism of ordinary differential equations by something that's important, <laughs> fundamentally important. <laughs> yes, so also eating is fundamentally important. We do it again and again. That's the, the only right way to, to do it. Um, <laughs> so, the same here, if I say fundamentally important, it's, it's uh, Donald Trump would say it's true. <laughs> so uh, everything is fundamentally important. You have to, to say it again and again, and uh, it's always uh, true. So, hmm, okay. <laughs> here, delay differential equations. The idea is that the next, uh, so we are talking about flows in time, so continuous time, that the rate of change depends on the current state, but also on the state of the system at some time before. So this is a delay term. I will give you an example of this, a concrete example from neuroscience on the next slide. This, you in a sense, automatically hit such delay differential equations if you look at, if you design models of systems that have feedback cycles where the feedback is not instantaneous, where there are travel times of signals or <coughs> chemical reaction times that do not happen in zero time but take some time, so where feedback loops in your system equations need some time to function. This is actually, I would say, typical for real world systems. So if one would do a very conscientious modeling, then one would very often end up with delay differential equations, um, just because um, many real-world systems have travel times for signals in, in their internal causal pathways. Once you have them, you need something like this, and then you suddenly, however, are catapulted into a mathematical region which is not kind to you anymore. So it's, it's a very hostile region, um, I will just give you one example. This is a classical celebrated one-dimensional, at least at first sight, uh, uh, delay differential equation. It's the Mackey glass system. It, it has an exponent of 10 here. I don't know where this came from. It is a physiologically a motivated equation. It, it was modeling. Now, I, if I remember right, the fraction of uh, white blood cells in blood, uh, who knows better? So I, I might be lying at this moment. This is what I just remember at this point. point. So it, it was in, med, uh, in medical modeling and of certain uh, immune processes in, in the human immune system. This 
system, this system equation came out of it. And if you run it, so you can just simulate, you can uh, MATLAB and, and Mathematica just have a DDE solver, so you can just plug in this equation and run it. And it has only single, it's, there are no vectors here, it's just a single number, this x. And then you get a system behavior that over time looks like this. So you get easily what is known as chaotic behavior here from delay differential equations. And the, uh, how do you say, the strong and bad message from mathematics is that although it looks you have a one-dimensional system, this x is just one number that starts oscillating, mathematically you have suddenly not a one-dimensional but an infinite-dimensional system. Why is that? What is the state? I, I mentioned this yesterday. State of a system can be seen as everything in a system snapshot that defines what's going to happen in the future. Here, if you have a delay of d, of delta, and then the, and you want to evolve this system, you want to simulate it, then in order to continue the simulation, you have to monitor, not to monitor, you have to record or save into your computer simulator memory all the points that you already computed between time t minus delta and time t. Because if you pass this window forward through time, which you need for simulating this, you need to know all these values. So the state here actually is not just a number, but it is all the numbers that you got in this interval from x at time t to time t minus delta. And if everything is concrete, that's uncountably many different numbers. So it is suddenly not only a high dimensional state, it's an infinite dimensional state, and even worse, it's a badly infinite dimensional state. So it's uncountably um, rich. We will later find, actually today, now, actually in, in five minutes, um, that, <laughs> that this is not as bad as it looks because there are ways to simplify the picture. But mathematics becomes nasty uh, in, in DDE, uh, uh, delay differential equations. They are much harder to, to analyze. Partial differential equations, that's an easy one. So <laughs> we skip them and skip directly to something that's vastly more complicated. So field equations, um, I, I will just, so there are many types of field equations. There's not the formalism for field equations. The idea is that in, if you want to, let's say model the brain, some of you want to model the brain, I'm sure. Um, if you want to understand what's happening at one point in the brain, this point, let's say, call it X, the location, one, one location, just one point in your, on your brain surface. Then in order to understand this, the field-oriented people try to understand this in the context of everything else around this point. So there are activation patterns on the brain surface which spread and propagate and, and co-determine what's happening locally at each localization. Unfortunately, there are also travel times, so signals can sometimes hop, sometimes if, if along an axon, but sometimes they spread more by diffusion on the surface. So it depends on how, what modeling assumptions you make. In order to cast this into a formal model, a formalism, none of the things that I mentioned so far, except maybe cellular automata, um, can do it. So you need something spatial, so that looks, that's, looks like you would need what's known as partial differential equations, which we skipped. That's for spatial modeling. But you also need travel times in, in the real brain, uh, when you suddenly would have something like delays, delay differential equations. And you also need something like possibilities of hopping, because there are accents, connections that uh, that make the whole thing much richer than if you just have a sheet where only diffusion could happen of activation. Okay, and in such situations, you can either despair and say nature is too complex and, and I, I, I quit. So I mean, there's a natural reaction <laughs> for a modeler. And, uh, or you could try 
to enrich your formalism with a number of ingredients until you have everything in it that you want. And this has been done and is, is being done. Yesterday, someone in the bar told me that he or she, I don't remember anything, wanted to go to a workshop on brain field theory modeling. Was it anyone of you? No. Who was that? Anyway, it's, it's a, a live field, so people do this. There's a, I, I know who it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was Tarek Bezold. And, um, so I, I'll just briefly outline this type of model. You want to understand what's happening at a particular location in the context of what's happening elsewhere. You, you include into your, I think, the, the, yeah. So you include into your equation uh, so-called field terms, that is, at point X, um, you want to define a quantity that uh, you call U, a potential. So here, I took this picture from, from a book, uh, and therefore, this U is not my U. So they use this U for local potential and not for input. Um, so they want to have a model that tells them what is at this location x at time t this potential of this neural field. So then they set up something that looks like a partial differential equation, time constant times this derivative. And now they, they have an interesting term here. And this term, first of all, there's just a natural little decay locally, everything, so the potential diffuses away. But then there is an integral over places, so it goes over space. And at each position, in, so think of this as brain surface, um, this goes over, so this integrates over other locations called y, so this is this dy here. And then at other locations also something happens, and the things that happen elsewhere have an impact on what's happening here that is weighted by a weighting function in this simple model here, which is just a function of the absolute distance, but it can be a nonlinear function term, times something that now also has travel times embedded in them. So do you think you can analytically solve such an equation? No way. So <coughs> at, uh, period. So don't even try to think about it. Um, so the only thing you can do with these equations is to simulate them on, on a computer. And this can be hard enough so, uh, to do this efficiently. Um, I have 22, uh, no, 12 more minutes. Over beer tonight, I would like to talk about um, uh, <laughs> This, this fundamental, uh, how to say, split brain situation of modelers um, when their models become so complex that they can't analyze them anymore. So, and then they have to take resort to s computer simulations, which is what is done in, in large scales. And what you still can get from computer simulations of models that you don't understand anymore. So that seems like a, <laughs> a weird thing. These models are, the, the mathematical implications of these models are just impossible for you to understand, and for me and, and for everybody. And so you run them on computer simulations, you see fancy graphical output, um, and then how do you analyze or how do you interpret what you see in this output? That's an interesting question, which I just raise as an interesting question at this point. It, it would take much more time to discuss this, yeah? Is it the same as dynamic neural fields? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, this is a specific, uh, there, there are many variations of this. So there is not the single f neural field formalism, but they all, that makes them a neural field algorithm, they integrate information from other places. Um, 
And that makes them different from just partial differential equations. Partial differential equation only looks at local gradients, but not at, let's say, transport of information from other places. What do you think of it as a theory of unified cognition? Because that's how Gregor Schöner wants it to, to be. No, over, over coffee, tea, or beer. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> this is... Uh, Gregor Schöner is, uh, has g been giving courses on this here, and um, uh, he's really wonderful. But as a machine learner, uh, so I'm a machine learner, engineer, I want to, uh, to make things function in the end, I think there are certain limitations to these formalisms uh, from a machine learning side. But that's all I want to say here. That it takes, would take much more time. It's, it's one of the approaches of modeling that I think are indispensable. So in order to get a full understanding of what may happen in the brain, you need, among others, also this perspective. But I never think a single perspective gives you the full answer. So a theory of cognition based only on this, I think, would not work. But that's my private opinion. Okay, yeah, so that is my, one of my favorite parts. Um, Taken's theorem, who knows it? Ah, not so many, good. So this is, uh, we started five minutes late. May I run over time for four minutes? <laughs> so that's a bargain. So you, you, you earn one minute for free. So. So I now want to say a few words about the notion of a state of a system. We, we just use that word and think we understand it. And in f 14 minutes, you will not understand it. And I've, I will be glad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the idea is uh, the, the naive view of a of state of a system, basically it's a snapshot in time. The system does something like these billiard balls, they, 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 they kick around, they're kicked around. And if you just take a, 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 a screenshot or a snapshot, that's the state of the system. The, sta the physicist would say classical uh, engine and a classical uh, um, Newtonian physicist would say the state of a system is given by all the masses, their, their, their impulses, their velocities and locations and orientations and, and possibly vibrational modes and that's it. If, if I know that about the volume of gas, I have the state, and fine, that's the state of the system. Uh, it's, it is the system at time t. The system state is just the system. So the systems, physical systems have state, they exist. Because they exist, they must be there. And if they are there, they, they are there. And to be there means to be there, and that's the state. <laughs> so, roughly. Okay. Now, have you ever thought about states? No, you just use the word like I do, everyone does it. Oops, hello. Yeah, I, I, I emphasized this yesterday, so I'm not going to repeat this again. That, I think this is a dogmatic, deeply ingrained uh, view in, in the brains of, of modern sciences. That, okay. So that if you think more about it, there are a number of problems arising, and I will um, not spend too much time on this, uh, on, on highlighting some of these problems. I, I want to spend time on one particular problem later on, on the next slide. So some problems is that it's, uh, you could say this would be problems that only the real physicists uh, uh, appreciate. It's not so quite clear if you have relativistic models of time, what is simultaneous description, state description of a large system. Because uh, in relativity theory, the simultaneity is, is not, not an easy um, concept. So just a cross section through reality at a certain time point is, is not so well defined in, in relativistic physics. Um, but okay, we are not physicists here, at least I am not. And then there is, um, philosophical uh, issues with this. Uh, I think that's closer to some of us. Um, no one has ever really seen the state of a system. We can only observe systems through observables and only think there must be something that is the system 
from which these observations come. And then you are deep in the messes of philosophical considerations of what is the ontological status of, of reality, so to speak, and what, uh, how does it relate to making observations and how can we as scientists or just normal humans um, react to, uh, to, uh, to knowledge what is not, and so forth, and so forth. So it's a philosophical discussion that can easily be uh, spin off, spun off from, uh, from thinking about states, and I'm not going to do this here. I'm going to do something simpler, uh, namely, and this is also something I will just skip, I will just show to you that there are some other representations of state, ideas of state, that if you start thinking about them, are also very natural and they are functional. You can play with them on your computer. And they are not presuming that nature has state. Okay. So, and one key to alternative views on um, state, on the notion of a state, is Tarkin's theorem, which I will now outline briefly. So assume we have uh, just an, a scalar times here, so some measurement oscillating over time. One can turn this into higher dimensional time series just by a mechanical trick. So this is a, uh, it's a, it's a sort of a pop-up of, of one of these little curves here. So I just take, instead of one time point that I plot, I, I consider three successive time, pots, uh, time points and then one time point here becomes three values, namely the current, previous one, and one before the previous one. So I, I just turn a, a scalar time series, just a one-dimensional time series, into, in this case, three-dimensional one by just taking what is known as a delay embedding. So this is just mechanical. So this is, uh, it, it seems like the new step uh, time uh, the new state, or let's call it state now, is three-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. So, and then if I plot this, it's now three-dimensional, if I plot it in 3D, and then project the 3D again on the 2D on, of the screen, then I get something like this here. So, this time series is one-dimensional. I artificially create by this delay embedding a three-dimensional time series and plot it and suddenly I see structure that I did not really see here. So that's the, the magic of delay embeddings. And they are, they're just nice for plotting also. So if you have one-dimensional time series and want to celebrate them and, and make them just more fancy and more tasty, uh, you do a delay embedding and plot them in 3D, and then you can turn this in MATLAB, and, and you can see a really three uh, wonderful thing. So now Tarkin's theorem says the following, and this is really a fundamental theorem. And I I take it so this says a little bit it has too much terminology in it. So I will try to ignore this this box. And, and, and just uh, listen, and I try to explain this simpler than, than that. So if one has a high dimensional dynamics, for instance, like this, a brain dynamics, here it's only three dimensional. So this is, this is a dynamical system that evolves in a three dimensional state space. Think of it as the real system, let's say the brain. An empirical researcher can only observe some observables of such a real system. So one always, universally in a sense, has only a very low dimensional access to some high dimensional reality. For instance, you can just measure blood pressure or oxygen flow or whatever, so, uh, uh, or reaction times, I don't know what, so something. But certainly not, the, you don't measure the entire brain. Impossible. So in this demo example, or baby example, reality is three-dimensional, and you observe only one dimension, so observable at time t. So that is this, uh, this line that we saw before. Now, 
one takes this one-dimensional uh, 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 time series and uh, you know or you feel you know that the original system should be three-dimensional. And now you turn this into a three-dimensional uh, time series uh, with this trick of delay embedding. That is, you take this, that's all you have as an empiricist, that's your measurement data. You take them, do a delay embedding, and then you get something like this. And then you see, okay, this looks similar. And now comes Tarkin's theorem. Tarkin's theorem says, I think it's on the next slide, it says, if you do this under the, under the right mathematical conditions, which are not very demanding, so it's a very general theorem, it applies very easily. If you do this correctly, then this will always work, that you can reconstitute your original system from which is high dimensional, from a low dimensional observation. So reality is high dimensional, you only know low dimensional stuff, and from it, if you do this delay embedding, you get a pl plot of the system dynamics that is not metrically exactly the same, but it has inherited all the important fun fundamental, the F word, uh, characteristics. <laughs> so for instance, the number of attractors the look, uh, the, and so-called Lyapunov exponents, so degrees of, uh, uh, of convergence, stability, all of these things are exactly copied from this to this. Only there is something, a leftover dissimilarity that you can repair by, in a sense, thinking of this as a rubber thing. And if you would just distort this picture in, in a rubber way, you would get exactly this picture. So up to these rubber sheet transformations, or mathematicians would say homeomorphisms, um, it's identical. So this is deep, I would say, that under certain conditions, a high dimensional system whose state, now, now we are talking about states, whose state is high dimensional. You observe only low dimensional, Tarkin's theorem says one dimensional, you observe only a scalar, observable from this. And if you now do a delay embedding of this one dimensional, you will get something that's again the high dimensional. So, and this is in itself amazing. It has been, I have one more minute now. It has been used and misused a lot in the past to try to infer back from neural recordings of all sorts uh, properties about, for instance, chaoticity in the brain. So chaos in the brain has been uh, attempted to be proven by delay embedding tokens. Uh, so one gets something like this. It looks much more noisy in, in real brain data. One reconstructs something like this, analyzes this and finds, okay, it's chaotic. Uh, these things have been very popular, let's say, 20 years ago. It turns out that the numerics are so devilish that, the, the, that this, these things have been overinterpreted a lot. That's something I do, do not want to go into here. I want to go into the fact that now we don't know what is the state of a system. I originally said the state of a system is three-dimensional. It's the brain state. It's a high-dimensional thing that defines what is your brain at this moment. Now it turns out with this delay embedding Tarkin's theorem, um, that you can also define the state to be a scalar observable at this point plus memory, plus a few state observables before. So then suddenly the state is spread out in time and it's mathematically the same information that you have there, basically. You can transform them between, yeah? Isn't this very similar to... Um looking at a physical system in phase space where you have high derivatives. So yes, it is related. Also, the proof of this uh, uses this. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's like describing not just uh, the system's um, uh, position, but also the velocity. No, no, the, the physicists... The, the you map that onto high dimensions, but you just have more <coughs> observation that you're making right now. No, it's, it's not quite the same thing. Okay. Uh, so. Um, the, 
maybe uh, because it would take a bit too too long. Uh, maybe after this uh, we we talk about this. So. So what I wanted to do here is, I think that's over, teaser, comments, yeah. So I, I stop with this. This theorem, Tuckins theorem, was in, found in the <coughs> 1980s, I think, or late 1970s. And it became quite popular for about a decade when there was an, uh, an avalanche of results from the neurosciences where this was used and in order to reinterpret scalar brain measurement data in terms of high dimensional dynamics. And then it was found after some while that uh, they, these th things have been over interpreted. And the problem with this is that, so that's this, when the original systems are not coming from a clean deterministic dynamical system, as Tarkins requires it, but from noisy ones, it, it, in higher dimensions, it becomes difficult to distinguish noise from high dimensional chaos. And so today it, it has fallen out of favor again, this Tarkin's analysis. But I think it is um, at least an eye opener to what states maybe are and are not. And I will say more about states, to, not tomorrow, to, uh, this afternoon. Okay, so thank you for your patience. And then, uh, so, uh.